And I think the entire American dream model is going to have to change. So I think okay. a lot of Gen Z and millennials are like looking toward buying a home as being the answer to wealth and kind of like a safe place to hang out. Um, I, I think that we're going to have to look at other wealth generation tools to like stocks and business ownership. But um, yeah, in terms of what they can do to prevent whatever might happen in the future, I don't quite know. And I wish I had a better answer for that because a lot of this just does come down to policy and responsibility to policy. And that's yeah. a difficult thing as an individual to achieve. And I think that's why we see elements of nihilism as well. I've sort of long been interested just personally because I'm I'm 28 years old. Um, I've owned, I'm tr transacted property a little bit, like I've owned a home in Austin, Texas, and then Austin, Texas, that housing market has interestingly sort of corrected in a way that sets it apart from places like LA or San Francisco or New York. I'm also a renter in New York. So I like remotely, I'm a landlord of a property in Austin, but I'm a, a renter in my residence here. Um, and so I feel like I've spent a lot of time unpacking the premise, like the pros and cons of owning, but the the fundamental premise seems to be that home ownership is this, you know, massively symbolic thing in our American narrative, our American story. There's this sense that, um, you know, this is really just a, a huge vehicle for wealth building. This is sort of the way, and it, it's also a, a, a signifier. It's a it's a way of communicating to those around you that you're an adult or that you're ready to start a family or all of these things. Um, and it just it it's imbued with so much meaning in a way that renting is not. But I'm also fascinated by the Japanese housing market and real estate in Japan is looked at super, super differently than it is in the United States. Um, do you have any sort of grand theories about how home ownership and its centrality to wealth building in the American dream is going to change over the next 20, 30, 40 years? Yeah, I think the difference with Japan is the land increases in value. So the properties don't increase in value, but the land does. And so it's, it can be weird there too. But I mean, I think that like the, so I'm, I'm 27. So I'm kind of in the same boat as you, where it's like looking at homes and being like, can I, like, what can, what is this? And yeah. I think a lot of people, you know, one in every four Gen Z are homeowners, but 78% of those Gen Z have had financial support for the down payment from parents. Mm. And so I think that's kind of very oh, cool. like, awesome. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I pulled I feel this like from your block jazzed. here. Okay. And yeah, you know, the, <laughs> The interesting thing about, well, I mean, one thing that struck me about this, I I want to hear more about how this stat came to be, yeah. because when you look at where the lines begin, you see that Gen Z is starting out at a higher home ownership rate than either Gen X or millennials, um, not higher than, well, actually, I, guess, I don't know how far the baby boomer line is, uh, actually goes back, but uh, at least higher than uh, millennials and Gen X. Um, so are, you're saying that this is largely because of synthetic they're, uh, more likely to receive some down payment assistance from mom and dad? What are you saying about synthetic bliss? Oh, I was just I was saying what Zach was saying, which is like, is this generation that we're looking at, like, is the main reason why they're able to afford homeownership because of, um, you know, receiving payment, receiving down payment help from parents? That's what the surveys say. Okay. So, yeah, 78 percent of. Gen Z have support from mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. Uh, and that makes sense, right? Like that's kind of what you'd have to do, I think, for a lot of people because you just haven't had that many earning years. But well, the other possible vehicle, like I'm thinking about my situation, like I'm married and my husband's a few years older than me. And so he's had a longer span of earning years than I have. He makes way more than I do. But also like the dual income thing is like I would not be able to get approved for uh, the types of mortgage that I would want to be approved for on a journalist, uh, a 28 year old journalist salary. Right. And so but but that I think my story probably is not representative of other people's stories because we're seeing people push off getting married until way later. Yeah. No, so, it's yeah. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Well, no, I think, yeah. That, so to Zach's question about the, or maybe it was your question, somebody's question about the American dream and housing. Like, I just think it's going to yeah. change. Like people are getting married much later. They're not having kids at the same rate. Um, and, you know, in the 1990s, Americans used to live with their parents until they were like 23. And now the average age of leaving them is 26. And so, um, which I, I was really surprised by that statistic. It's average, so I think it's skewed. But um, we just, people are just living life a lot later. And maybe it's because we're living so much longer. But 
yeah, it's it's going to be really interesting. I just I don't think home ownership is going to be the path to wealth, and that's going to be really difficult for people. There's another um, interesting bit of data you visualized here um, showing the assets by wealth percentile group. So that that turquoise bar at the top there is real estate. And as you go down to people have less and less wealth, more and more of their wealth tends to be in real estate in their homes. And once you're up to the top 0.1%, their portfolio is, you know, a very small portion of it is real estate. So what this shows to me or implies to me is that for, you know, the bottom 50% of wealth holders in America, their homes are a, are an investment. That's a big part of, of, of their wealth. Um, at the same time, we have this issue where um, the houses are too expensive for new, new uh, as many Gen Zers and millennials to get into the market as they want to. How do you resolve that paradox? Resolve the paradox of making housing affordable or well, the fact wealth. that housing is both a, a place where you live uh, and that in a sense, I don't know, it just feels like there's strong incentives for house housing to go up and go down. Like it's almost like politically, um, we kind of want both. And we can't have it properly. Yeah. It's both right. a speculative asset and a place to raise your kids. And I, I just, I don't think those two things can be reconciled. And homes, yeah. like, they didn't increase at this pace until, I want to say the 1980s was really when they started to see homes just skyrocket in value and for people to use them as kind of a retirement plan. Um, and so I, I don't think that this can continue. I don't know what's going to happen with house prices moving forward. You know, um Harris has put forward her economic proposals, which include building 3 million homes, and that should help with uh, perhaps affordability, but it's going to take a long time. And then I think we have take to- the form of tax credits given to developers. Is that the mechanism? There's a couple of different mechanisms um, that they would use, but yeah, tax credits, the low income housing tax credit is definitely one of the most popular. I think they've built two and a half million homes with that since it was established. Um, you would think that, I mean, she's not focusing on subsidizing demand, is she? Like, you would think that there would be very predictable ripple effects in the housing market that would, in fact, not be helpful. In so the, the house, the home builders have to build. Oh, the home builders have to build. Yeah. But were there other mechanisms by which she's attempting to um, give financial assistance, especially to first generation home buyers? Yeah. Yeah. She had a whole, I think it was like eight or nine proposals around housing. Um, yeah, I think I've got some of them here, actually. So yeah. this is her agenda to lower costs for American families. One, as you mentioned, calling for the supply or the construction of 3 million new homes over the next four years. Um, I was looking into the historical data there, by the way. Um, and uh, over the past five years, this is according to data compiled by iProperty Management, um, an average of 1.4 roughly new privately owned housing units broke ground annually. Um, 1.5 million is the five-year annual average. So uh, 3 million is actually not a super ambitious target, I, I don't think. No, but, we need like um, eight, 8 million homes. We need a yeah, lot of homes. Uh, but yeah, Liz was mentioning this uh, $25,000 down payment support for first-time homeowners. To me, boy, like, um, just clear on that for one moment. Like to me, that looks like subsidizing demand. Like to me, that doesn't seem like it will necessarily yeah. help, and in fact, might hurt. Yeah, that is subsidizing demand, but there are policies around expanding supply. I think the thing with the but, down. But can we linger on that first for a second before we get to the other ones? The twenty-five thousand dollar down payment assistance, I think, has gotten a lot of attention because it's like, oh wow, the federal <laughs> government's going to be sending out twenty-five thousand dollar checks or something. What do you think of that specific proposal? Um, you know, from an economic standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about it in my my newsletter yesterday, and I'm trying to pull that up right now. But um, you know. People will definitely say, like, you can't subsidize demand, especially when we have such a housing crisis that we have now. And I think that's true. Um, it's not really that people need more assistance. But 
I've done a lot of interviews with the chair of the, the Council of Economic Advisors, Jared Bernstein, and there's something called the pencil out problem, where even if you build affordable housing, those who can't afford housing will not be able to afford that affordable housing. And so some sort of demand side substitution is necessary to get those people across the finish line. Um, but even if you have $25,000 on a down payment, I think even with a $400,000 house, you still need $80,000 for a down payment. And so $25,000 isn't necessarily going to you know, get you across the finish line there either. But yeah, demand side subsidization when we have a supply side problem is not something that we should focus on. But I also think we have to focus on home insurance. Not, I keep on saying that, but I, I just think everyone's not talking about home insurance. I will die on home insurance. <laughs> I, 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 I want to really ask you, <laughs> I want, honestly, I, I do want to ask you about home insurance in a second. Let's look at a couple of the uh, other Harris uh, proposals here. The first ever tax incentive for building starter homes, which Liz mentioned, uh, a historic expansion of existing tax incentives for businesses to build rental housing that is affordable including a new $40 billion innovation fund, um, and then um, cutting red tape and needless bureaucracy, streamlining the permitting process and reviews. On that Seems last one, issue. That, I mean, that that's like music to my libertarian ears, although I'm a little bit, I, I don't know how much the federal government has to do with that versus, you know, state and local, but um, it's, it's a good instinct. The thing, um, the it yeah, annoys me a little bit about some of these proposals. I mean, first of all, yeah, that's not really in the purview of the federal government, though state and local governments certainly take cues from federal government policy when they see um, the head honchos of their party embracing a different approach to permitting, right? Like, I'm sure they'll pay attention and perk up. But the thing that bothers me about so much of the developer incentives um, and the building new housing, like, yes, that is absolutely true that that is important and, in fact, required. But fundamentally, like we're going to be experiencing this massive lag because, right, like this will, you know, get started as soon as Harris uh, takes office if if she wins. And then when is the soonest that these homes will actually be <laughs> occupied by the people who need them? And then there's also the other thing, which I think uh, missing middle housing proponents yeah. talk a lot about this. But I also think like we can't be agnostic as to like the types of housing um, that, that are being built. And I think one thing that's been especially interesting has been the degree to which de developers sort of aren't building starter homes the way that they sort of used to. And so there's like all of these weird little pockets of needs where because like people aren't just, it's not just that there's like one type of house that fits everybody's needs, um, but rather, and, and I, I want to trust the market to deliver for people what they want, but like even looking around at like New York City rental properties, you can find a lot of one bedrooms, you can find a lot of two bedrooms, but then when you get into like that three bedroom that's still within a, a reasonable price range, the, the, the likes of which a family with two kids or three kids might want, that kind of thing, you, you really get bumped up into needing an entire brownstone or needing an entire townhome in a way that's just like not accessible. And there's so many examples of that, not just in New York City's housing market, but all over the place, right? And so the type of housing that is being built definitely matters. And then also like starter homes specifically, right? Like it's a lot harder to find that 1,000 square foot single family home in a mid-sized city than it used to be in 1990. Kyla, what do you make of that? I just threw a million things. Yeah. No, no, all, all great points. Yeah, Mis missing middle is so important. Townhomes, duplexes, triplexes. Um, it's something that we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about or investing in. Um, and then I also think that housing supply is really important. That missing middle of housing is really important. Um, and it's something that people are thinking about. But the issue is, is that the home builders also are struggling with capacity. Like lumber is kind of an issue. Labor costs are a big issue. And so even if we have all of these policies that can be passed around housing, um, it's not like Builders can go out there and build them in some cases. Joe Weisenthal out of Bloomberg has talked about that too. And so I think there, like you were saying, like there's all these pockets of need and all these pockets of problems in the housing market that are creating this massive, massive issue. And right. if you ascribe to the housing theory of everything, which is, you know, how people feel about their ability to get housing <laughs> impacts literally everything that they do. Um, and it impacts like their health, it impacts how, how they make interest they have and when yeah. you have them, right. right? And like, and it's like from home, whether or not you can have a flexible childcare situation, like right. there's a million things. That yeah. Happen, and no right? wonder we have a demographic crisis. We have a housing crisis. The two things, they're intertwined. Yeah. The, my worry, my sort of high level worry with this approach to it, though, uh, I mean, I'm in full agreement that 
there seems to be a housing shortage and especially in big cities, it's not affordable for young people to, to find places to live. Using um, tax incentives, uh, just the tax system generally to try to encourage certain kinds of housing and discourage other sorts of housing. Um, the, this idea that, you know, we need to build more housing, I think is a little bit, it, it runs the risk of unintended consequences and creating bubbles that, uh, mm-hmm. that like we, I, I think this partially happened in the last housing crisis, that there were certain initiatives to, you know, well-meaning initiatives mm-hmm. to push people into mortgages that then blew up. And if you're not having, uh, if if it's if it's not a true market demand that you're meeting, and instead you're kind of tipping the scale towards certain kinds of housing or against certain other kinds of housing, instead of just simply deregulating land use, that you're going to run that risk of just creating asset bubbles again. Um, yeah, I, that... mean, I I think now the prices are so elevated that there is like a sense of demand there, like there is a market that would be met. If we freed up some housing, like that would, I think, be the big difference rather than giving mortgages to people who are obviously not able to finance it. And like lending standards have really tightened since 2008. So I think that sort of financial crisis would be avoided. But yeah, I, I think that there's other pockets of the economy that could make homes apps. I think homes are always at risk of being a bubble just because, yeah. of, you know, we treat them as investment tools. And anything that's associated with investment has the opportunity to get ugly. Hope you enjoyed that clip from Just Asking Questions. You can watch another one here or the full episode there. We have an audio version of the podcast, which you can subscribe to using the link in the description and subscribe to Reason TV for notifications when these episodes go up every Thursday. Hope to see you then.